everybody. Good morning. I'm so glad y'all weathered the storm. You made it in safely. Nobody melted. That's a good thing. So um, thankful for the rain. <laughs> Washed away some of the pollen. And uh, we need the rain. Uh, I want you to stand with us if you would. Let's pray together and welcome the Lord at, in our presence. And we're going to sing the first two songs. or simply to lift him up and to honor him this morning. So let's do that. But let me pray with you first. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to come together with brothers and sisters in Christ. And most importantly, to come here to worship and honor you. You are the center of our attention today and hopefully each day. And Father, I pray that as we worship corporately here, we would hear the words that we're saying and singing and that would be the message from our hearts and our minds as we lift you up and acknowledge that you're an awesome creator. You're Lord of the universe. You're our Savior, our King. Father, I thank you for this special time and place, and I pray that before our meeting is over, everyone here would know you if they haven't already made that decision, that they place their faith and trust in you. I thank you, Lord, for forgiveness. Thank you for grace. We're going to talk about grace and faith here just momentarily. I pray that you would help us to be able to focus, uh, take off the burdens, the the concerns or the worries of the world, lay them at your feet and trust you. And, uh, I just thank you, Lord, for this special time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You ready to sing? Yeah. Yeah.
blessing us, which he certainly does. Sometimes we just need to bless him. Bless his holy name. And he is indescribable. Let's continue to sing through the period of our ties and all no children about you, the heal sick, to help the elderly, to, and just to spread your word, to spread your word. And we get to be, thank you for letting us be a, get to be a part of that, 
to spread the gospel, the good news of your son Jesus throughout all the land. Thank you for letting us be part of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning? Yeah. Good. Good. I'm glad. Did y'all have a little rain last night? A little bit. A little bit. All right. Um, today is our anniversary. Um, thank you. I'm going to treat this like a weatherman. See, we've actually been married 23 years, but the heat in that makes it feel like it's 40. <laughs> Kidding. I'm gonna need a ride home with some people. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Happy 40 years. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. That's right. Um, it is uh, good to be with you here this morning. I'm glad Jack can walk and take up often because last night he was under the cabinet in need of prayer, <laughs> uh, trying to, to fix their countertop and so forth. I appreciate those that have come and, and, and helped in the house and keep praying. Hopefully we'll be in it um, soon. I'll just say it that way, soon. Uh, and, and having said that, uh, we give them permission to take a couple days off this week because I'm trying my best to get this finished. And Monday's usually my day off, so I'm going to take Tuesday and Wednesday and just focus on the house. So having said that, I'm going to ask our deacons to run some interference if you have things you need, if you'll call them or text them. If it's an emergency, uh, please call me. But um, other than that, if you would uh, try to reach out to the deacons, um, Brandon Jones will be here Wednesday night to speak in my stead. Brandon's been here before. Uh, a friend of mine is just a nice guy, um, and uh, I love his heart, and uh, just you'll enjoy Brandon being here this Wednesday night. So just so you know, I won't be checking my phone as, uh, as often uh, the next three days, and I pray I'll be focusing on the house and pray for us there, um, and I appreciate your understanding with that. Um, also, I have created a problem in that Wednesday night, I posed a question to the crowd, and I told them to think about this, and they'd get an answer this coming Wednesday, and that was before I realized I wouldn't be here this coming Wednesday. So now you have to think about the question a little bit longer. I'm not going to ask Brandon to give you the solution to that question. But the question I gave to the group Wednesday night was, does God hate? And I asked them to think about it, to dwell on the answer, and if you come up with an answer or already have a steadfast answer, 
Where do you get that answer? Is it in Scripture somewhere? Does God hate? The follow-up question to that is, if God does indeed hate, does He expect us to hate the things that He hates? So, you think, well, that's such a weird topic. It is a topic not talked about much, but it's certainly one addressed in Scripture. So, now you got a week and a half to think about it. So, um, sorry I won't be there Wednesday to answer the question, or at least to uh, direct you, but you're, you're um, resourceful people, so you'll figure it out between now and then. Um, and uh, I will show you a video that um, Jim Simbola spoke on this subject at Liberty University last week and kind of started the wheels rolling. I thought, you know, we don't talk about this. And it's part of a problem in our culture today and, and in the churches. So uh, interesting. So I'll, Lord willing, I'll play that video for you Wednesday, a week, a week. But uh, please come this Wednesday and enjoy Brandon's teaching. And um, he's, he's very musical as well. Matter of fact, the guitar that's in my office is Brandon's. Uh, he loaned it to me to try to, to learn a little bit on it. And Jamie's been helping me a little bit with that. And I'm just, just pray. I thought maybe somebody else can use that guitar and do a better job than I have. But um, anyway, thank you for your patience and understanding. I learned everything I know. <laughs> that's true. Um, continue to pray for Ms. Angela. Um, uh, we had a memorial service this, this week. So continue to pray for she and her family and, uh, and others that are going through struggles, uh, trials, uh, surgeries. And I believe Tom's <coughs> having his second eye surgery Tuesday. Is that right? How's it been, Sam? Okay, well, he's having his second one, Sandy, and I understand we've got another surgery coming up uh, Wednesday, is that right? Some, somebody else is having a surgery Wednesday, Mr. Ken? Yeah, yep, your wife told on you. You're having a surgery Wednesday, eye surgery, so pray for Ken, Karen. And uh, also, uh, Mr. Gene, Colonel Gene, is going on, he's going on a lark, he's going over to Switzerland. We're not even invited, but anyway... Pray for Gene as he travels the world, and um, I'm glad he's getting to go. I'm glad he's traveling. And pray for Gene and his safety as he travels. Um, we have been asked to pray for Carolyn Carroll. Carolyn Carroll, I think that's correct. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, acknowledge the others that are on the prayer concern the prayer list, and I've heard several names in Sunday school that will be added to our list this week as well. Tom and Helen Hurl, are they stateside yet? They're stateside. Okay. So they'll, they'll be here sometime. So they're the missionaries in the Philippines, and, and Tom is, is James' brother. So pray for them as they go around and visit and, and uh, fellowship with other believers, and then one day they'll get to come here and we'll get to talk with them. So. Also acknowledge the other things in your bulletin, the upcoming Bible studies and events, um, flowers, refreshments, uh, all the things that went on uh, in the past week. Uh, we had a body life meeting, a team leaders meeting, and a reporting of that. The coach, thank you so much for bringing the coach for the shepherd's table. I did not take that box this week. We did have a shepherd's table and ministered there. But um, we're going to suspend the coach just simply because of the weather for now. They don't need any more for now. Um, but continue to bring the toiletry items if you would. Thank you for doing that so much. And um, Sharon, where's Sharon? There you go. Sharon's going to come sing and preach, so Sharon here. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Not that we're old, but we <laughs> not exactly spring chickens anymore. But um, how important it is to share the gospel with children. I thought of three scriptures. Proverbs 22, 6. Start children off in the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not depart from it. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in training and instruction of the Lord. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 7, These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. So, for me, these verses just stress how important it is for us to share our faith with our children, to grow them, uh, to pray for them. So how is Homewood Baptist involved in, in accomplishing this? And we have four ministries, outreach versus inside the church, four uh, missions. The first one I want to go over is the CEF, which is Children's Evangelism. Um, they sponsor the Good News Club. I think a lot of you are familiar with that. But so I wanted to say uh, the Good News Club, and this is off their website, is a ministry in which trained teachers meet with groups of children ages 5 to 12. So we're looking at the elementary school level. Um, just about anywhere they can meet with them, but typically it's in the school. It's only in the schools here if that particular principal allows it. And we are lucky that Homewood Elementary down the street, um, both their principal and their assistant principal are Christians and have allowed uh, Bethany Bible Chapel actually runs the Good News Club, but they allow Marsha and I to come in and we assist. We're like little shepherds, so we sit with the children, make sure they behave and don't get too antsy, which amazingly, they're pretty good. They are so, as I think Marsha even mentioned it Wednesday night, they are so wrapped in the story and the gospel that has been given to them. The scriptures, the songs, it is a wonderful thing. It just will do your heart good to see these children so excited to learn. So that's how we're involved in that. We don't have any money budgeted, but I did want to thank you all because this last year we raised, uh, not raised, but collected uh, items for the teachers' rooms. We did, I think it was tissues and wipes, if I can remember correctly. And what we did is we put what we collected in there with Bethany Bible Chapel chapel so that each teacher got a nice little package. We also have done the clothing. Uh, we did underwear and regular clothing for children in case they have a little accident in the school, whatever. So that's how we're involved there. No budget, but we are involved personally and through collections. The second is the Coastal Missions. And I know you all remember the three ladies that came and spoke with us. Just uh, blew me away what they're doing. And this is geared more towards the middle school and high school students, and I think you all know, but what they do is they basically bust the children off the school premises, and they're taught a Bible class. And one of the statistics they had on their website, which I thought was pretty impressive, is 85% um, of the students that go to these classes do not attend church. So this is the only way they're being fed, is by going to these classes. So this year, when, after they came and spoke we, at one of our meetings, we decided that we wanted to give towards this ministry, and that would be to help pay for teachers. They needed buses at the time, which I found out they got in the bus, and help sponsor students. So at the leadership meeting, we voted to set aside $5,000 to donate to this cause. We also had someone generously donate another $1,000, so this church body will give $6,000 to help these students hear the gospel. It will be teach, taught to them in a classroom. <laughs> Thirdly, our hearts for school. Uh, they came, well, no, they, let's see, they came this year and spoke, but Marsha, Sandy, and I attended a meeting last year, and then again this year they came to the school, they came here at the church to present. What they want to do is, this is through the South Carolina Baptist Association, so when you're giving to the um, Jamie Chapman. Jamie Chapman. That's where some of this money is going, and some of it turned around and came right back to us. So what they want us to do is just basically to um, pray for our local schools. Pray for the teachers, the staff, the students. 
uh, we're going to try and find a way that we can go in and serve the school. We um, actually had a call from the vice principal who was ready to meet with us, but unfortunately it wasn't good timing for us, so we've had to postpone, but hopefully we'll um, get with them soon. But anyway, we decided at the beginning of the year we would budget $1,000. And through the Heart for School, we were given a grant of another $500. So we have $1,500 that we can spend towards a project. And uh, hopefully, we'll know exactly where we're going to go with that money. Next month is teacher appreciation. So Sandy has ordered some little flashlights. They go on a keychain. They say Home of Baptist Church. And then we're going to put them in a bag with some candy and um, a little note saying how these teachers are alike, these students. Um, but I have a special favor to ask. I got a list of all the teachers' names, all the staff, and what I'd like to do is let you know that Kirsten, Paula, Marsha, Sandy, and myself, and the pastor are all on that committee. We each have little pieces of paper with five names on it. Those names are either teacher or staff member at Homewood Elementary. It says their name and their position. Some of the positions I couldn't make heads or tails out, and Marshall know better about that. But uh, if you would see one of us at the church and take this list of names, there's going to be five on it. Pray. Call that person's name up in prayer. Listen. You know, we talked this morning, Sandy did a wonderful job talking about how important our prayer life is. Um, there is no one thing that's not more easier for us to do than to daily get on our knees and uh Worship and pray for others. So anyway, I'm excited about all these. Our fourth is the, the it's going to be coming up soon. Before you know it, are the shoe boxes. And I think about those shoe boxes and their contents and all the children that are going to be receiving them and how we can touch their heart in some way. We've seen some of the videos, and so uh, I'm just happy to say I'm proud to be a part of this church body. And thank y'all very much. And don't forget to see one of us after church for a list of those names. If you're willing to pray, call them up by name in prayer. And thank you. They've already had me preach this one. They've already had That's right. Thank you, Jim. I've heard that it said many times you can tell the depth of the church's spirituality by their missions, how they reach out. We minister to others, and I'm so thankful that our, our church as a whole is reaching out, is ministering to our community, and children, and families, trying to figure out ways to connect. Next month, which is coming up really quickly, next month is the bike rally, and for the first time, as far as I know, uh, we're going to see if we can help with the Christian Motorcyclist Association, handing out water, whatever it is we can do. And I found out this past week we have two full patch members of the Christian Motorcyclist Association. So they're going to help us with that contact. But there are other ministries as well that we, Shepherd State and others that we're involved with. So I'm so thankful for that. Mm. Children, can you help me for a second?
But I want to ask you this because we can't control, none of us control what other people say to us or about us. What we can control is what we say to or about other people. So I want you to think of it this way. There are other children, other young people that are having a bad day and then someone may have made them feel bad. So what we can do is say something kind to them. We can encourage them, right? Can y'all think of a friend that you might can say something good to or something positive to or something that would encourage them to let them know that they're special or that they're important because God created them? Okay. All right. Well, sometimes as believers in Christ, we forget, we focus on what comes our way, negative stuff and hurtful stuff, instead of focusing on what, how we can add some some kindness and, and compassion to other people by speaking some things that the, that the Lord has given us, kindness and love and patience. So they help sometimes to focus and, and we pray about the brokenness and when we're sad and people say things we're not supposed to, but if we will focus on encouraging other people and making sure that they feel better and that things are not just... Uh, that we tell them the truth according to the scripture and help them, then we forget a lot of times about our own problems if we help other people, okay? So today, the, the scripture in Romans uh, 12, verses 3 through 8, it talks about thinking properly about who we are. Sometimes we think less of ourselves than we should, and sometimes we think we're too much of ourselves, and that's what we're going to talk about today. To know exactly how we should think of ourselves, it comes from the Bible, and only from the Bible, okay? So if people try to make you feel bad about yourself, don't believe them. You get your word from what God says about you, and he created you, okay? We're going to talk about that. And then you help other people to understand their value comes from God, and because he made them too, okay? Say that one more time. Well, I hope y'all have a good rest of your morning, and you're going to go back and learn some more things and have a good time back there when you start. It's okay. And y'all give them a hand. All right. Let's stand and sing. Um, this song is simply a praise to our Lord. His name is wonderful. Uh, so let's sing it together. someone that thought a little bit too much of themselves. Don't be poking people or looking over an extra two year or anything like that. You ever run into someone who thought too little of themselves? Okay. Today's scripture focuses on those who would become a little haughty in their self-estimation or self-worth. Um, 
But we do it both ways sometimes. We, we feel badly about ourselves in the way that we shouldn't. And sometimes we think too good of ourselves in the way that we shouldn't. So there's a fine balance, right? So as I spoke with the children, where do we get the correct assessment of who we are and of what our worth is? Bible. Yes, from God, from His Holy Word. The society we live in seems to put a label on everybody, and if you don't fit in the box or have the, the, the label on you that everybody else has, um, you're kind of cast aside, right? I saw a very troubling testimony of a lady who was interviewed um, in the last couple of years, and I can't remember if I shared this with some of you before or not, but it was eye-opening to me. The lady was not a believer in Christ, and she lived in a, a city that's known for its diversity. It's known for a lot of things, not its Christianity. But she was out west, living in California, and she was a very high-ranking official in her company. And the interview to her was about why she had been canceled and fired from her job and had to move from her town that she loved so greatly because she didn't fit into the society's agenda and into their um, box that they wanted everybody to be in. And it was troubling because, she, like I said, she was not a believer and she had very worldly views, but she lived in that town and stated so because they were so diverse and because she could live there and just kind of live a very... Um, Loose would be a word that we would say, but uh, she could do whatever she wanted, be whoever she wanted to be. In the last several years, she found out that that was no longer the case because there is an accepted agenda and an accepted um, theme um, in our culture right now. And she didn't fit in that exactly. And she asked a simple question during a business meeting of her corporation. Is this what's best for us? And she was questioning some advertisement or, uh, advertisement um, possibilities that were being posed to the company. She simply asked, is this what's best for us? Because of that, she was canceled. She was pushed aside. She lost her job. And when I say canceled, that's a, a term that's thrown around a lot today. All of her contacts, all of the folks that she had life with pushed her to the side. And she was so brokenhearted that she had to leave a city that she loved dearly and a company that she had worked so hard in for years simply because she didn't fit into to the aggressive agenda of our culture today. So she had to wear a label. And that's, that's pretty tough, you know. If you are not who people expect you to be or if you don't fit into the mold of what society accepts at that moment, you can find yourself being isolated from those that you have cared for, cared about, worked with uh, so long. So sometimes we get our worth, and I say sometimes, it's really a lot of times we gain our worth from what people say. They tell us what we're worth. They tell us how important we are or how important we are not. They tell us whether we're accepted into the culture, into the the circle of friends into our work uh, um, relationships there or not. That's hard to deal with when people push you aside, right? You know what that's like? So sometimes our assessment is too low. Sometimes it is too high. So if you find yourself as being one of those people who usually puts yourself lower than what you should, Today's scripture is not going to fit perfectly for you because this scripture is specifically talking about us putting ourselves higher than we ought. But there are both, both ends of the spectrum. And we all need to have a clear and very accurate uh, indication and assessment of who we are from God's holy word. That's where our worth truly comes from. Whether society is okay with it or not. Whether it's politically correct or not, which is usually not. Um, it doesn't matter. God tells us who we are and the importance of our lives and the value that we hold because He created us. And that should be the thing that matters most. You with me there? Yes. All right.
Uh, James said we already had a sermon, so I got to move on here. Uh, we're in Romans chapter 12, uh, 3 through 8. Chapter 12, 3 through 8. And you have to remember what, how this chapter began to understand how it continues. The first part of the chapter, as Paul is writing to this first church here in Rome, he, he says, I urge you, I beg you, uh, brethren, by the mercies or the compassion of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. And we talked about that last week. Now, verse 3, having said that, he says, For through the grace given to me, I say to every man among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Now, he prefaced this with saying, because of the grace given to me. Through the grace. Why did Paul need grace? Did he need grace? Is that an assumptive assumption? He did need grace, right? Why? He's a sinner. And who was he before he was Paul? Saul. Okay? Did a lot of heinous things. And whether we act out of our nature uh, in various ways or not, the nature is what's heinous, the, the sinful nature. Paul's acknowledging here, I need grace. And because of that, through the grace given to me, I say every person, and I know it's translated there, every man, but the word it literally means everybody. Everybody um, among you, uh, uh, not to think more highly of themselves than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. And listen to these words: God has allotted. It is God who gives faith, and it is God who is given the portion of faith that we each have. For just as we have many members in one body, as all the members do not have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us each exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So he goes to not just what we do or what we're equipped or gifted to do, but in the manner that we do it, the attitude that we do it in. I can't cover all this today. I don't want to cover all this today. What I do want to do is focus on how Paul begins this exhortation or admonition, if you would, with the church here. Through grace given to me, I say every person not to think more highly of themselves than he ought to think. Now remember, the first two verses say, present yourselves a living and holy sacrifice. Someone who thinks too highly of themselves doesn't like to submit or to yield or to bow. Okay? I understand, I don't know how accurate this is, but I understand in some cultures, for instance in Japan, um, the bowing is, is, not, is not just to bow, but it is to the depth of which you bow. The angle of which you bow represents the respect that you're giving to the person you're bowing to. So you can actually bow and be a little disrespectful to others. And I know that's not just in, in the Japanese culture, but in others as well. Things that we do sometimes to give respect to others or not, it, it says a lot about our hearts and our minds. And when we think too highly of ourselves, we don't even see what we're doing that's disrespectful or that, that hurts others. When I was asking the children here, I wanted them to understand, you can't control what people say about you, you know that? But you can control what you say about others and you can help them and pour into their lives. In about three weeks, we have our 40th high school reunion and I've been on Facebook more than I've ever been on Facebook trying to catch up with our friends and figure out the details of what's going on and a couple of our classmates called and we've been uh, talking briefly and so forth but I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who was actually heading up the reunion and we played baseball together and uh, David and I, but David that watches so often McVeigh, we were in the band together, we had a lot of fond memories and you, you won't have fond memories and think back to those, those special times but there were some bad things too 
And you want to push those out of your mind. But a lot of times the bad memories are from things that people said. How they treated you. Remember that? That somebody said something to you and you never forgot it. You ever done that? Okay. You need to let that go, don't we? Let that go. But it molds us. Unfortunately, it shapes who we think we are and the value that we have. We have to be very careful. I'm looking forward to our reunion. Um, we, 84 was the best year ever, period. The best year ever invented. Um, it's great. The music was wonderful. But I'm um, looking forward to that because we did, and we talked about this on the phone the other day, we got along remarkably well. And we were just 20-some years into integration. Um, at our, where we came from, our group, our, our class got along remarkably well. And we're all thankful for that. And I'm thankful, looking at Facebook, of how many of our classmates are believers and are talking about the grace of God and the love of God and serving Him. And so I'm looking forward to that event. But words, words are powerful. You know that. They, they shape us. They, they encourage us or they will bring us down. You can have a great day and somebody speaks something to you and you just fall apart. Do you understand? So as the church can't control that, but we need to be focusing on how we can speak the words to people that would encourage, would lift them up. So Paul says uh, not to be too holy. Uh, and I want to tell you this is not the only place we see this in Scripture. So go back to Romans, the third chapter of Romans, if you would, uh, verse 27. Romans 3, 27, and you'll find these words, 27 and 28. You there? And Paul, again, Paul's talking about being justified by faith. And he says, where then is boasting? In other words, what place does boasting have in all this? It is excluded by what kind of law or works? No, but by the law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Same God. So Paul has to speak here of different classes, of different ethnic groups, uh, just as a reminder, especially here to the Jewish community, that the Gentiles are also loved of God and given the opportunity to be saved, to be believers in Christ, okay? So he said, don't think you're the only ones, okay? It's by faith. Look over at chapter 11 in Romans. Go over to chapter 11, verses 18 and following, and you'll find these words, chapter 11, 18 through 21. And again, Paul speaking to the church here in Rome, he says, Do not be arrogant toward the branches. He's given the, the, the picture here, the, the, uh, uh, a metaphor of a, a vine growing. He says, Do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. <coughs> you will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. This is an admonition to the Gentiles, because now they're a part of being grafted in. And he says, listen, don't be haughty, because the Jews have been pushed aside for right now, and because of their unbelief. He says, you're there by faith as well, and if you think for a moment... That God would push aside his own people and not you. You're missing a point here because he certainly will. And that's how that verse ends. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. So be careful in thinking of yourself as more important than others. Which takes me to the next passage here in Philippians 2. Go to Philippians 2 if you would. I love this passage. I love the fact that Paul writes it twice in prison. And he's encouraging others. He's also writing some admonitions here. But he's doing this as a reminder of why we should think properly of ourselves. The second chapter of Philippians, verse 3. Um, and this is, this is what he says. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility. Can we be selfish people? Come on now. Can we? Yes, we can. That's our nature, right? Okay. Do a little bit from 
selfishness or empty conceit. Is that what it says? Nothing. Doesn't leave very much room there. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. Why does he say of mind? If you think it, if you think it, and, and this is, you've said it on, this is what I know, and this is what I'm going to believe here. Everything else is going to come out of that. If you truly believe it, if your mind has set on, this is how it is. So he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each one regard one another as almost as important as himself. Is that what it says? More. More. You sure that's what that says? More important. More important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Not just for ourselves, but for the interests of others. And then he says, this is why. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Okay. Do we have a great example of humility? Yes. yes, we do. And as he lives his life in and through us, we too must humble ourselves and consider others. And as I share with the children, so many times we're so concerned about what others do and say to us instead of being more concerned about how we treat and speak to others to encourage them. Consider others as more important. And I'll end with this passage. If you go to back to Matthew verse 20. Matthew verse 20. And this is one of those times in Scripture where this is probably one of the most uh, natural moments for a mother, I think. Especially a mom who and I always, I've said this before, I always want to know what happened to Zebedee because his two sons who were running the fish business have departed and his wife went with him. And she served Jesus for the time that he was here in his earthly ministry. And, and James and John were, were faithful followers. And what happened to Zebedee? He's running the business all by himself, I guess. I don't know. That's just one of those things I wish I knew. But I want you to understand something. Their mother has been part of Jesus' ministry. By the way, there were several women who supported Jesus behind the scenes throughout his whole ministry. And the Bible speaks of those women and their support. And when we talk about the resurrection, you see them coming to the tomb and running. And as Jesus spoke to Mary first and told her, go tell my apostles, what an honor and a place of respect that he gave. That's another sermon. But anyway, I just thought I'd share that with you. But here in the 20th chapter of Matthew, um, verse 20, Jesus has been talking to his apostles. He's there with, uh, um, he's been there with, with Lazarus, Mary, Martha, and they're talking and he's teaching them and so forth. And he's getting ready to enter into Jerusalem the next day. And so this is the end of his earthly life. And he says this, verse 20, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons. She got both sons with him and, and, and bowing down, making a request of him. And he said to her, What do you wish? And she said to him, Command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right, one on your left. Can y'all understand that? You know, Mom says, Listen, Lord, I... I can't think of a better place for my sons to be than right beside you. But can you can you tell me, can you promise me that you'll make a place for them on your right hand side and your left hand side? Now you understand they're not in a room by themselves. Okay, so this doesn't sit well with the others. <laughs> Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? What's he talking about? What's about to happen to him about a week later, less than a week later? Crucifixion. He's going to be crucified. Okay. They said to him, We are able. He said to them, My cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right hand and my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared to uh, by my Father. So Jesus says, You're going to drink the cup. In other words, you're going to lose your life as well. Okay. 
But I can't tell you who's going to sit on the right and left. Only the Father. He, he's the one that appoints those positions. Verse 24. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. A little jealousy going on, you think? How in the world could they have even asked this? Why would they? Can you see that happening? But Jesus called them and, and he explained. This all comes together right here. But Jesus called to himself and he said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom or a payment for many. Okay? Who is the only man who has ever set foot on the earth? And I say man loosely there. Jesus, right? He's perfect. He's the only perfect man who's ever set foot on earth. And yet he's talking about humbling himself. He didn't come to to be served, but to serve. Is that a great example for us to follow? Yes. Sometimes I'm afraid that we become haughty in spirit, and this might not be a lifelong thing, but day to day, sometimes we become haughty in spirit because that's what's expected of us. And some people will expect us to, to have a little bit of an attitude, and we get confidence and arrogance confused. And unfortunately, in the world we live in, arrogance and ignorance seem to couple, they seem to be together a lot. Okay? Ignorance, uh, the lack of knowledge. Uh, I'm not using a disparaging word there. And lack of knowledge. Sometimes we become arrogant in and of ourselves. It's, we, we miss something. We've missed something a lot. When I was uh, young and uh, in school down in Garden City, uh, Denley Kaufman took me under his wing. And I didn't know that I needed to be under his wing. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the respect I should have given him when I was 20-something years old, I didn't. I didn't disrespect him to his face. I just didn't appreciate what he was doing like I do now. And I thought I had it all together. Y'all remember being young? Y'all remember being young? <laughs> all right. There's something about that that you feel like you have it all together and all figured out. And, and life is a process of us knowing that even the more we know, the less we know. And the longer we live life, the more humbling it is if we allow it to be. So I want you to take these past this verse, these verses in Romans today to heart in that, yes, we can think too lowly of ourselves. But today, this, this particular passage is talking about us being too haughty and thinking too highly of ourselves. And Paul gives the example, and the Lord gives us the, the, the greatest example here about him emptying himself. We are here to serve. We are here to love on others. We are here to reach out to others and make disciples. Otherwise, the moment we place our faith in Jesus, He should just take us on to heaven, right? We're left here to serve. And I want you to, to just remember today that if you have to stop before you serve somebody and run them through the filter of, do they fit my demographic? Do they fit my political stand? Do they fit my financial and economic class? Do they... If you're running people through a filter before you decide if you're supposed to help them or not, then you've missed the boat. And, and, and you and I have to run them through the filter of God's holy word. And we just did that this morning. So we are here to serve and to make disciples. And that only comes when we humble ourselves. And that means to get an accurate picture of who we are. Not a... a this, I'm a, I'm a lowly worm, not good for anything. I'm just going to lock myself in the closet till I die. Not that. An accurate picture of who we are. Do we have worth? Yes. Did God create us in His image? Yes. Are we sinful by nature? Yes. We have to put everything together. 
and lump it together and then read God's word and say, this is who I am. This is the value God's given me. And he commands me to put others first. Consider others as more important. And that's why Paul says here, be careful. Be careful thinking of yourself higher than you ought. Now, just to give you a little spoiler alert here for what's to come, Paul's about to talk here about spiritual gifts and how we are to serve the body of Christ by our giftedness and what God has given us. You and I are not going to be willing to serve other people if we think it too highly of ourselves. So he's given us a recipe. Submit, yield yourself to God, humble yourself. Then let's talk about serving others. Okay? Those Sometimes those times that we are reluctant to serve is when we think, nah, somebody else can do it. We're smart enough not to say that, but we think it. You know, well, I didn't think they got themselves in that situation. Why in the world should I have them? I know you never thought that in your whole life. But sometimes that's our attitude. Okay? And you have to go back to where my mom goes back so many times, and I'm thankful the Lord just kind of reminds me. You remember the situation I found you in? While we were yet sinners, Christ died. So we can't use that as a qualifier for others. We're not here, we're not here to point fingers. We're here to lead them to Christ. Make disciples. So let's humble ourselves, church, and serve others. We're going to sing a song, you think, but this is not an invitational song. It's not. But it's a song that talks about the cross that we just talked about in length several weeks ago. <laughs> Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Life changes because of Jesus. We're to enjoy that, live in that reality, and to pass it on to other people. Okay? Burdens are lifted at Calvary. There's a free, liberating uh, uh, thing that happens when we enjoy and, and take the life of Christ into our lives, and then we're to pass it on to other people, to put others, think of them as more important, more important than ourselves. Would you stand and let's sing the song together. Birds are lifted.
countenance on you and give you 